Greetings and welcome to the Midwestern Pavement Preservation Webinar. My name is Phil Rufus, Pavement Engineer for MoDOT's St. Louis Metropolitan District. The Midwest Pavement Preservation Partnership comprises of representatives from each state and province transportation agencies, along with members of industry, consultants, and academia. We seek to develop and advance sound pavement investment programs through the free exchange of ideas. Today, we have four fine presentations for your enjoyment. Our first presenter is John Sanger. John Sanger is the engineer of pavement technology at IDOT, Illinois Department of Transportation. Before joining IDOT, John was a consultant engineer working on a wide variety of projects. He has a bachelor's degree from Bradley University. The title of the presentation is Microservicing Issues and How Illinois DOT Fixed It. I wouldn't say that they're completely fixed yet, but uh, the current results look promising. So there's still time, time will tell exactly how we're doing. Moving forward, uh, we noticed some issues with um, some of our residual asphalt contents in our microservicings. Uh, sometimes they were tending to be out of spec or just on the low side of uh, the job mix formula. We've had some bonding issues and I've got some great photos and some videos to talk about that. Some of the ways that we're addressing some of these issues are with uh, changes to our mix designs and uh, how we're handling mix designs, as well as uh, calibration training and, and things like that, making sure the pavers are uh, doing what they're supposed to do. We'll kind of go over some training, how we're closing the feedback loop in Illinois um, with the technical working group, and then some additional research that we've got going on. So I've got about 20 minutes, so uh, buckle up and we'll get moving because it'll be kind of fast. This is one of the projects that we had in one of our uh, southern districts. As you can see, this the microservicing in the picture on the right is only about, uh, I would say, 10 minutes old. It looks very dry in its nature and we had, we had some issues uh, initially with this project. Uh, the picture on the left is a, a more overall shot. Uh, this is the handwork that was performed uh, at this bridge deck. So as you can see, the bridge deck is skewed and, and we just had some issues on the first pass of this, this microservicing. What we kind of noticed from a lot of this was that we started by taking some uh, asphalt extractions following uh, Ashto T164, just thinking that we might be able to get some sort of knowledge out of, out of what we were experiencing and what we were seeing in the field to kind of verify what our eyes were telling us. But in order to validate what we were getting from the extractions, we we enlisted the help of some friends at Heritage Research Group who mixed some lab samples and uh, performed the same extraction tests to verify that, you know, we could actually get a known asphalt content back out through that process. They were successful and we've subsequently done some of our own testing in our lab and uh, are able to do exactly that. So moving forward with that, uh, IDOT's putting that into their specification in for 2021. And uh, we are requiring that the residual asphalt is plus or, plus or minus 1% of what's uh, detailed in the job mix formula. Because of some of the issues that we saw on the uh, roadway, uh, we increased our minimum residual asphalt from 5.5% to 7%. Uh, typically, we haven't seen a job mix formula that was uh, below 7%. So we set our threshold at 7% just to kind of give us a bottom line and hopefully push things a little bit higher as far as our residual asphalt content. Moving on to our bonding issues. Uh, this is a roadway that has received, received a single pass microsurfacing in 2013 and then received a uh, double pass micro in 2017. And these pictures are from uh, January of 2020. Obviously, we didn't get the life that we were expecting out of the two-pass micro. Um, we had a lot of debonding issues uh, throughout the roadway. I'll go ahead and get this video started. This is uh, some operations crew driving down the uh, same stretch of roadway. As you can see, we lost a lot of material, especially in the wheel paths. And, uh, so we've got some three quarter inch uh, potholes and distressed areas that that are making the road rough and and potential safety hazard for motorcyclists and things like that. 
So um, what we did was we took some cores of this project as well as some cores of other projects that have been known to use tack coat. Uh, we went back through the construction records and noticed that the original 2013 microsurfacing uh, did not apply tack coat, even though it was in the plans and, spec and specifications that one should be applied. I'm not exactly sure what happened on the project, but it was it was skipped. And when we evaluated the cores, there was almost no bond strength between uh, the cores on the project where we had the debonding issues, and there was very good bond strength when when they applied a tack coat. We decided that uh, this was probably one of the best practices. You know, in my discussions with other uh, pavement engineers from our surrounding states with the Midwest Partnership. Um, TAC codes seem to be something that was not always used, but it was a, a good recommendation. So uh, in 2020, we inserted a TAC code requirement for all of our microsurfacings at a rate of uh, 0.025 pounds per square foot, and that's residual asphalt, not an application rate. So far, we've had some pretty good success with the with the TAC code, and it seems to be uh, helping in many ways. It was kind of an idea that was a good good insurance policy to help uh, get more performance. As far as the mixed designs go, we are we were seeing some issues with uh, some set times and return to traffic times. We were getting very inconsistent product utilizing the same mixed design and materials. A lot of the microservices in Illinois seem to be using a steel slag as the main aggregate. Uh, so that's widely used on a lot of the mixed designs. And we'll generally see the same mix design for various parts of the state, but yet we were getting very inconsistent products coming from the same contractors using the same mix designs and the same materials. So it was a little puzzling. Really, there was a, a lack of knowledge at the district level and lower on, on microservicing in general and how all the components interacted with each other in order to provide the treatment that we are uh, planning to get. So in doing so, we reached out to Heritage Research Group again, sent a group of people over to go through the mixed design process that they that they utilize in developing theirs. We got our hands on material. We actually went through and made several mixed designs, uh, altered the asphalt content, altered the cement, the water, um, and all the various components. And it was it really taught everyone in that group a lot about microservicing and and how it interacts with each other. So we thought that it would be a good idea to bring this back to our, our state and, and host a lot of the materials engineers throughout the state at the district level and, and anybody that really wanted to be involved in, in these workshops. So uh, Heritage was kind enough to come over and assist with those workshops in our central office. We also took uh, or reached out to Ohio, who is part of the Midwest Partnership, but uh, doesn't actively participate all the time. They seem to have a pretty good microservicing program going on. Uh, they've got a standardized job mix formula sheet um, that they use on a regular basis and, and is well developed, uh, requires a lot more information than what we were getting on our job mix formulas. So we uh, asked to borrow that and we kind of made some modifications for Illinois and we will be requiring the, that stop, standardized job mix formula form to be turned in at the beginning of the year with the submittal of job mix formulas. Going with that, here's some pictures of our design workshops. Um, as you can see, it was pretty well attended. Uh, everybody seemed pretty interested in what was going on and they were learning a lot. The Central Office uh, Bureau of Materials has acquired uh, some of the testing equipment. So we will be verifying certain aspects of the job mix formulas um, at the beginning of the year and uh, supplying approval letters basically saying that we reviewed it, we agree with the components and the mixtures and the ratios. Hopefully that will help uh, give us a little bit more consistency in what we're looking for. One of the other things that uh, seemed to be lacking was any sort of calibration training. Um, and I say calibration as far as the paper. Uh, a lot of the district personnel uh, hadn't really noticed or observed any calibration happening on, on site nor do they really know what to expect and what this and what calibration involved. 
we went through and we did some presentations or a presentation and some training. We developed a standardized form to help with the inputs and give a lot of the background and guidance on on the process of calibration. And uh, that is mainly tailored towards some of the older vehicles or the older pavers that have the uh, analog counters and even some of the uh, early digital counters. We had more on-site visits from central office to help the district staff in, in performing the calibrations, well, not performing them, but observing the calibrations and making sure that the uh, paver is adequately set up for the job mix formula. So moving on to some of the training that we've got planned for 20, the rest of 2020 and 2021, we are under contract with the National Center for Pavement Preservation uh, to provide us some microsurfacing training. COVID is is really wreaking havoc on that plan and that uh, that contract. So we're hoping to still get that done. Um, I need to talk to Neil and everybody to see if we can get get that either virtual or if we can wait till next year and potentially do that in person. We have responded to the Federal Highways invitation to attend the it's a virtual workshop in January. Um, we've already got 30 participants signed up and uh, we are trying to get funding in order to send an additional 50. So that's in the process and I think that's got a pretty good shot of happening. Uh, we're planning on holding some more mixed design workshops for both the materials people and construction personnel. I think it would be wise for construction to, to see what the microservicing looks like if you vary certain aspects of the mix design so that way they can better identify uh, what's going on and troubleshoot with the contractor. We're working closely with David Peskin and Applied Pavement Technology on developing some online training to help with a lot of the uh, pavement preservation treatments in general. This training is piggybacking off of the SHARP 2 R26 project and, and the just-in-time training. That should be available for all of the personnel within IDOT, either on their computer, on their iPads or iPhones, and hopefully it'll it'll do well for everyone. So getting back to our feedback loop, early on when I, when I got into this position, there wasn't a lot of information coming back from the field as far as how projects were going. Uh, we really kind of had to dig into the pavement performance data in order to figure out whether things were going well or not. In January of this year, we hosted the first uh, pavement Preservation Technical Working Group. Uh, this consisted of uh, industry, IDOT Central Office, the uh, district construction materials people, as well as a few consultants. The plan is, is the first few years, uh, since we're doing a lot of changes to the specifications and, and really learning a lot about uh, what, what each other's expectations are and what uh, we're capable of, uh, we'll probably be meeting twice a year, uh, once in the spring and then once in the fall. We have our next meeting of October 26th um, to discuss the specification changes and then what went wrong this year and, and what went well. Some additional research that we've got going on. We're trying some uh, microsurfacing mix designs in our uh, moisture room here at the Central Bureau of Materials. Uh, we've got a room that we cure concrete and cement samples at it's running at about 99% humidity. So we're we're to trying to determine what kind of effect humidity's got on microsurfacing set and break times uh, at those high humidity levels. Uh, we're still working on refining the asphalt extraction sampling and testing for microsurfacing. Um, we feel comfortable enough right now to put it in the specifications at the precision limits that we've got set. There might be further refinement later down the road. We're working on a QA project for percent embedment for uh, chip seals with the Illinois Center for Transportation. In-house, we've got uh, pavement markings on various uh, treatments. We're evaluating how the pavement markings are, are working with the various treatments and the life expectancy of both. And then there's a, we're kind of playing around with the idea of looking at emulsion break times and trying to predict them with electrical conductivity, but that's uh, a little further out in the, uh, distant future. I kind of have a question and kind of a, something that's got us a little stumped. Uh, this was a project earlier this year. Um, as you can see in the left, there's uh, some washboarding. On the right, there's a, a an enlarged picture of what's actually going on. Uh, there's 
seems to be these little balls of ag aggregate um, below the microservicing surface. Um, our specification requires that there's a uh, screening device next to the stockpile before it gets transported to the job site, but yet we're still seeing these these aggregate clumps. We're hoping that this will this probably problem will remedy itself uh, with just some more construction oversight, but we'll see. So I'm open to any thoughts and ideas. So that's all I've got really right now. I think we are holding all the questions till the end. So uh, I will turn it back over to you, Phil. And thank you. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.